What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of EV Nutrition Radio. I had a guest today, and she was a delight to be able to have a discussion with because she does something very similar to what we do as far as nutrition coaching. It was really awesome to have her on. Her name is Kate. Um, I always like, I don't know, I think I'm going to butcher her last name, but it's either Lyman or Lemon. And she is a nutrition coach. And we had an amazing conversation how she approaches nutrition coaching with a lot of her clients. But let me tell you a little bit more about her. So she's a wife, traveler, and lover of the outdoors. In fact, she loves it so much and or like she loves traveling so much that she's actually going to be moving to Mexico, just picking up and going and taking her business over there. And uh, I think it's in January. So I think she's definitely an adventurer. And it was really cool to be able to uh, kind of hear about this. this is actually not on the podcast but we talked about it afterwards she's a nutrition coach and honor owner of kate lemon nutrition or kln uh, she's worked in the fitness industry for almost a decade now she's actually shared her story how she started as a crossfit trainer back in 2011 when many people didn't even know that crossfit existed and the main thing was like at that point she was just trying to obviously kind of like be a trainer and like focus a lot on the fitness but then she started shifting her focus more to nutrition and working as a nutrition coach that has elevated as a successful nutritional coaching business that has celebrated actually five years very recently, very similar to what we have done with Vivid Nutrition. She has her, or Kate and her growing team have helped hundreds of people to change their bodies and eating habits, as well as breaking the myths around dieting and healthy lifestyle. She believes in a good workout, but in good workout buddies, kindness, pink sugar cookies, which in, interestingly, we didn't really have a chance to talk about, uh, long hikes and 9 p.m. bedtime, uh, and of course, sharing evidence-based truth. She does hold a bachelor's degree in exercise science, a master's degree in public health. Um, she's also going to tell you how she started a PhD and why she actually kind of abandoned it. Um, and is also a certified health education specialist. Today's conversation was awesome. There are some freebies at the end, so make sure that you listen all the way through in this entire episode as we talked about reverse dieting. We talked about um, what to do when you're traveling as far as your nutrition, uh, the importance of like, you know, consistency over perfection, which is a lot of the things that we typically preach in our program as well. Um, with that said, I'm going to leave you to our episode. I believe it's like 96. I don't remember where we're at of Vegan Nutrition Radio. So without further ado, here, here is uh, Kate Lemon in another episode of Vegan Nutrition Radio. Hopefully you will enjoy it. All right, guys. So as I mentioned on the introduction, I have the pleasure to have uh, Kate into our podcast. Kate is a nutrition coach and I am super excited to have her. She's from Memphis, Tennessee, as she just told me uh welcome to the show kate how are you thank you i'm great i'm so happy to be here yes and you and i both obviously share something in common we're both nutrition coaches and we try to help people obviously improve their lives but i'm sure like this started somewhere um at some point in your life so uh why don't you kind of tell us a little bit about you and what kind of got you started in this entire path to uh become a nutrition coach and, and to kind of help people in this specific area yeah, so it's, it's kind of crazy. So I have been in the fitness industry for a long time now. And when I was in high school, I, I mean, I was always into sports and, and fitness and kind of into my nutrition. But when I was in high school, I got my CrossFit L1 certification and started coaching CrossFit. What years was um, this? Like, cause, <laughs> this, is, this is 2011. Wow. So that was like when, when CrossFit was just still kind of like new yes. for a lot of people. Yeah. And my mom did CrossFit and she brought me to CrossFit and I was like, oh, I love this. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So it was a long time ago. I've been doing this like it's been like nine years, which is crazy. So I went to uh, school, went to college, studied exercise science, and I always had the goal of going to PA school or physician assistant school. So um, I coached CrossFit all throughout that time. And I was like, okay, that's just like my side job, you know, and I was taking nutrition classes. I was like, I really like this. This is really fun, but like, I'm going to be a PA. Um, and like fast forward, I was finally filling out my PA applications and I had this like very, I mean, I had thought I'd want to do this for like years. Um, and I had this thought, I was like, maybe I, maybe I want to work more in prevention. Like I, I don't know that I want to prescribe people pills or whatever. Like, I think I want to work on the prevention side. So I'm like halfway through PA school applications and I totally switched gears and started um, applying for grad school for a master's of public health program, like just total flip. Um, 
And at the same time, I kind of started doing nutrition seminars at the gym I was working at. I'm still coaching CrossFit and stuff. And it was always like, this is just my side job till I have like a real big person job, you know? So I went through grad school. I focused my um, MPH a little on nutrition education and health behavior theory. And those are kind of things I studied. And I found that they were really helpful as I started to take on nutrition clients, like from from clients in my gym that I was meeting and um, finished my MPH, applied for a PhD because I was like, prevention isn't enough. Let me go to research. Like, I want to do research. I want to be really at the forefront of like- you just wanted to go all out. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, let me be at the forefront of figuring out how to make people healthier. Um, But like populations rather than individuals. So basically I was in a PhD program trying to balance- KLN on the side, which is my nutrition coaching business, which at this time was like, you know, I was like really taking on clients. It was providing me income and stuff, but it was always like kind of my side gig. Um, And for some reason, I never thought it was valid. I was like, you know, I'm just waiting to get my professorship or whatever. Um, And I ended up leaving the program and choosing to take uh, nutrition coaching full time. And it was like really scary because I was like, but fitness isn't a real job, which like, that's not true. It totally is. Look, you're doing it. I'm doing it. A lot of people are doing it. Um, But it felt really scary. And um, that was 2017 or 18. So now I've been doing this full time. Um, And aside from like this kind of strange curving path of like education that got me here the whole time, like I've had a lot of personal experiences with my nutrition that have helped me. I think really become a better coach. Like in high school, I was that person who did yo-yo dieting, like as of starting at age 15, you know, and even through college. And um, I was like the typical, let me try to be keto, low carb and vegetarian all at the same time because more (laughs) diets must be better, right? (laughs) That's a typical one. Yeah, you got to stack them up. That's the way to do it. More is better, right? And so like I'm starving myself on the week and totally binging on like loaves of bread on the weekend. So, um, you know, I feel like I've kind of been in that place where, um, but a total hot mess <laughs> regarding yeah. diet. And it was a lot of my own experience of finding this idea of flexible nutrition that allowed me to really like kind of come to a better understanding on personal nutrition and allow me to, um, help my clients better as well. Nice. Yeah. Do you want to hear a funny story? Yeah, please. So, um, very similar to yours, actually. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. So I wanted to be, I wanted to go to med school and I applied to med school. Well, it's a little bit different, but it's same sort of like, you know, background. And I was like, you know, I wanted to like be a doctor. I want to work in sports medicine. I applied to the school. I actually didn't get in because it was so competitive. So they gave me an option to start nutrition school and, literally be because they told me it's a good stepping like stone or like you Mm -hmm. can transfer over and i was about to submit my transfer papers for med school and i was like no i don't want to do this i don't want to i want to work on prevention literally what you just said it's exactly my same process i actually went to like a therapist at that point because i was like freaking out about what i wanted to do with my life like my whole life i've been wanting to do this and now like i'm completely changing and she's like you know well actually doctors are not the only people that number one wear coats and then number two that are not the only ones that kind of help people actually live a healthier lifestyle so what do you think about that and i was like that completely changed everything um and and it's funny because i also wanted to get a phd i didn't get as far as you did Mm -hmm. uh but then somebody told me it's like you know do you want to be actually immersed into research and to or actually helping like one-on-one people and like working with them directly and and that to me was obviously a big kind of breakthrough because i decided okay as my, after my master's i'm not going to pursue my my phd so kind of so hearing it from you i was like okay i'm not alone and i'm the only yeah. person that kind of went through some path like this it's it, that's like totally i mean i was like okay let me help patients and then like no let's help populations and then like no let's yeah. research and help populations and you know we both wind up back to the individual which is still really powerful and i just do have to remind myself like that is really powerful because those individuals go off and help others. Um, and, you know, we produce content and education that helps as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's so like it's the, so the valid. Part. No, I know. And, and I think, but one of the most important things that you mentioned is like, you've also like, and I think that the most like successful coaches are the ones that actually have lived through some difficulties themselves. Right. And I think, and for me, maybe a little bit different than for yours, but you know, what, what are maybe some of the things that you learn in the process of like you, like with the yo-yo dieting or like all the different things that you did at that point 
that you wish you would have had somebody to tell you like, Hey, Kate, don't, don't do that. Like, that's not kind of like healthy or that's not kind of like the best approach. Like, so in, in your, like when you were 15, as you were kind of like trying to, to do this stuff on your own, what were some of the things that maybe like right now, like your current self would tell your 15 year old self about like the way that you were doing certain things? I think if I had had like any concept of balance in my diet, um, it would have been completely transformative. Like the idea of balance in my food choices, like to be able to eat a majority healthful nutrient dense foods, but also bring balance in through like the treats I wanted and things like that. But also like literally balance in the macronutrients I ate because I was a vegetarian for 11 years. Um, I ate no protein, but didn't even have the knowledge to like identify protein. Do you know what I mean? Like this, like this base knowledge and awareness of my food choices was not there at all. And it, and it led to having literally no balance. Um, and if anyone had told me like I could focus on fueling my body rather than just starving it, like it, well, would have saved a lot of tears and frustration for sure. Yeah. And what triggered you to actually become vegetarian then? Cause like a lot of times, like, was it like an external factor? Like, Oh, like maybe this is something, this is the way to actually like lose body fat, lose weight, or was it more of a, a more deeper kind of like meaning and what made you actually transition off of it after like, you know, 11 years or so that you did this? Yeah. So it was actually, okay. Th- and this is like kind of a funny story. So I was nine, I was nine years old. So it wasn't maybe the most um, informative decision <laughs> made ever, but it was ethical. My, I grew up in California and we were driving to Mexico and uh, like for a surfing vacation for a week and our car got a flat tire. We're just outside of LA, um, but kind of in like a rural area. And so we pulled over on the side of the road and there happened to be like a slaughterhouse on the side of the road, kind of where we are and the way it smelled and the sounds I heard and like just the visual of it was just um, like completely horrifying to me and my nine-year-old self. And I was like, I'm never eating meat again. And then I didn't till I was 20. Um, Really? Yeah. And, and, but, but because it was such a young decision, I really, it was not done in the best way ever because I didn't like replace what would have been healthful proteins with like other vegetarian protein sources. Like I ate pop tarts and peanut butter and jelly, (laughs) you know, and vegetarian corn dogs. So um, (laughs) it wasn't like the most educated decision. Um, And then fast forward to age 20, like I was trying to get a little better at CrossFit. Like I wanted to get stronger and I wanted to be a little more competitive And I was finding myself like really held back and gaining strength in like recovery. And I was literally always waking up in the middle of the night hungry um, and like, okay, I guess I'll have like another sweet potato or whatever. Um, And at this time I was, I was trying to do paleo too. So, you know, all the things, all the things, (laughs) all the things always. Um, And I was like kind of taking nutrition classes at the time. And it was that understanding of the importance of protein that allowed me to first add in fish. um, And then I eventually added in chicken and now I eat meat, but it's still very sparingly um, more sensitive to it. (laughs) It's like a very traumatic experience. Uh, Obviously at age nine. (laughs) No, I know. Like it sounds like it definitely was. And, and so, but now obviously you kind of eat everything. You just obviously Mm -hmm. are more like, and then you, you, and you talk about the concept of balance, which I think like for some, reason like people don't kind of seem to fathom like how that actually can exist in nutrition um and whether that's obviously through like social media exposure content consumption of like the wrong things or whatever but i think there's a lot of misconceptions as far as like you know what balance is so how do you define it yourself like you know what is balance to you and what is like the sort of like the philosophy or the concept that you try to teach your clients or your audiences when it comes down to like you know having a balanced nutrition approach because i feel like it's like a it's like a buzzword but at the same time people Mm -hmm. don't understand the meaning of it yeah and i'm actually gonna like flip it around and call this idea of balance flexibility because i think they i think while they're different words they kind of go hand in hand so um for me like this idea of flexibility in our nutrition is not only flexibility within our food choices like for those who track macros we know this idea of iifim and i don't mean like look you can eat a bunch of donuts and hit your macros i mean like flexibility to what I said before, fill our, our, our days with the majority of like healthful nutrient dense whole foods, but also add in those treats when we want them. 
but also flexibility in our approach and our strategy to our nutrition, because like strict tracking your macros is not the end all be all. And not everyone needs to do that. We can also have this like artillery of tools um, that help us navigate a meal out or vacation or whatever. And, and understand that we can lean back on habits um, in addition to this tracking tool to find balance in our approach to nutrition. Like it doesn't need to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be black or white. Um, And I really think balance is, is embracing flexibility in all of those facets. Yeah. I think, I think most people think of like tracking macros as like this, like diet that they're going to kind of embark on because they don't fully understand the concept of it. And I think one of the mentioned, one of the things that was really interesting about you is like the fact that you, you, you went to get your master's in public health and health behavior theory. I think I met, I think I heard you mention something yeah. like this. How do you apply that right now to the nutrition or like the coaching that you do with your clients? Because we do that a lot. Like we, we, we talk about the power of mindset and like the way that you obviously kind of have your mind and, you know, when it comes down to nutrition and the relationship that you're creating with food. So, so how do you kind of apply some of those concepts that you learned into like, you know, behavioral, like, you know, approaches and so forth into your coaching process right now? Yeah. So right now it's less about like applying behavioral theory, obviously, but just having an understanding that, um, there's so much going on behind the choices we make and behind our approach to food and how we feel. Um, you know, like we know that energy balance is key and that it, it's, there's like, te- like technically calories in calories out is, is the way, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that there is truth in that it's the law of thermodynamics, but that does not mean that this idea of like move more, eat less applies to anyone because there are so many um, layers to how we view our exercise. Is it like this transactional punishment or is it something we enjoy or is it something we overindulge in without giving our bodies rest? There's no, um, you know, there's so much, so many differences in how we view food for some people. It is the same idea. It's like transactional and we have to earn it or, um, you know, there's fear surrounding specific food choices. Like I think this knowledge of just a little more behavioral health allows us to, um, you know, as we coach, see kind of the why behind people are making specific choices, the why behind they, why they may fear specific choices or why they may fear change. Um, and just like dig a little deeper because it, it's what she said. It's not about tracking your macros. Like it's not just about hitting numbers in an app. It's like about um, really changing your food decisions and changing your mentality towards those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times like people like everybody's completely different when, and, and I think, you know, regressing back to people's childhoods is actually something that as coaches, it's helped us kind of understand why do people like make certain decisions point in case, for example, one of my clients is um, she, every time she sits down in front of the TV and like watching a show or something like that, she has a snack with her all the time. And like, she obviously kind of complains to the fact that she finds herself at the very end of the bag without Mm -hmm. she even realizing it. And then she basically shared the idea that it's like, Hey, this, that did you used to do this when you were a kid? And she told me like, yes, actually my dad um, and I, that's our, our kind of like time spent together. We would grab a snack and we would be sitting in front of the tv so a lot of times like those behaviors is kind of what let you to now as an adult do some stuff like that so when you tell somebody like it's like okay eat less move more like there's a lot of deep rooted things that you know right. have not been addressed and if you don't really kind of help the person see it then it's really difficult to change those things so it's, it's it becomes difficult absolutely and i think another very common a uh, situation is just people having this like very deep rooted idea of good foods and bad foods and having a really hard time incorporating those like quote unquote bad foods because there's just some very uh, real opposition to those like the thought that you know this is going to make me gain weight this is going to make me unhealthy um, and understanding these little nuances really help us help that individual bring a little more balance in as well yeah that's key now, when did you start or like, I guess like the whole concept of flexibility and how you kind of like teaching your, your clients, I'm guessing you use like a, a macro based type of approach with a lot of your clients. And, and I guess like the, the biggest thing is like, what I have seen a lot, is like sometimes people become over obsessed about it. Um, and I think they kind of try to kind of hit that perfection. Like I want to make sure my numbers are zeroed and all these different things. How do you approach those kind of like personalities that sometimes like 
over obsess about it, you know, when it comes down to like tracking macros and, and how do you kind of determine when to like maybe take a step back or, or kind of change the approach uh, when it comes down to, to this type of like, you know, methodology. Right. So I, I like something I just nail into my clients is that we're never looking for perfection. Like we're looking for consistency, we're looking for flexibility. And the goal is literally never perfection. Like, yes, get close to your macro targets. Um, but do we need to see zeros? No. Um, and I, and I think for some people that means starting out with, um, you know, a looser approach and then getting into a little more regimented approach if they're working towards say like a fat loss goal with a timeline, you know, but for others, they want total control and it's the opposite. It's like starting with this control that they want and then showing them how they can mm-hmm. be more flexible. Um, yep. Mm-hmm. so again, beyond flexibility and food choices, it's flexibility in, um, in approach for every individual because everyone is so different and it's this idea, um, of perfectionism among anyone that like, I think really holds us back. It really hurts us. And, um, this is nothing new, but this analogy, I think is like attributed to Jillian Michaels or someone at first, but like this analogy of, um, of the flat tire, like you're driving on a road and you pop a tire, you have a flat, do you like pull over and fix it and go on your way? Or do you pull over and get mad that you have a flat tire and slash the other three? Like that doesn't make sense, right? No one does that. <laughs> yeah. Yet we still use this exact same approach in our nutrition for whatever reason. Like, like, oh, I screwed up. Like, screw it. I'll start over Monday. Like that doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So if we're able to focus less on this idea of being perfect and more on just like consistency, like my numbers aren't perfect today, but I tried. I still, uh, you know, stuck to these habits of like, I went out for a meal and it's not going to be perfect, but I focused on a protein and a veggie before I had a more calorie dense side and I limited myself to one cocktail. So like check done. Good job. Let me move on with the next day. Um, Like that's powerful. That's what translates to really long-term change um, rather than just like having to have this app in your phone. And like, if you didn't weigh your food, you're wrong and you're bad and it's Oh yeah. Yeah. I've had people that even tell me that sometimes they bring the scale to a restaurant or uh, they do some really kind of like crazy things like that, which obviously kind of like leads to the point of like, when it's like, cause, cause I, I always kind of like preach the idea that you're not supposed to be, for example, with weight loss and fat loss, you're, you're, you're you're not supposed to be losing fat or weight like 365 days a year. Right. So like, how do you like have that conversation with people when it comes down to like, Hey, it's okay. If we take three months in which we are more like flexible and less rigid when it comes down to like, whether it's macronutrients and your choices and stuff like that. And when is it that, that you kind of try to decide or to say, you know what, now we need to kind of step it up and then we need to kind of raise the bar a little bit and then more rigid likeness. It's obviously needs to happen. Um, like how do you kind of establish that, especially with somebody like that are starting to work with you, whether they are on a timeline or not, like how did you kind of like view that? So we like really truly have a conversation on, periodization like we really talk about like like a what's your favorite um nfl team are they training to be peak performance all year round no they have like seasons and the seasons are necessary or else they're going to get injured and they're not going to perform their best when it comes down to like playoff games or whatever right so we have to adopt this same idea that it's okay to have seasons within our nutrition and um my goal for my clients is that when they head into a fat loss phase, they're set up in a way that will make them the most successful. Like they've spent time at maintenance. So they know what maintenance is. They know how to track, but also how to be flexible. They've had time to be flexible. And so they can really dial in with this fat loss phase because there's nothing more frustrating than like saying you want this fat loss and then not really being able to commit to what's required to get there. Right. So if we have this time to focus on maintenance or maybe we were actually in a surplus for a little bit, it's going to make it so that we can really dial into this fat loss phase, see really good progress. And then from there, work on maintaining that progress. And that's really what it should look like, like a a short period of fat loss that is not the whole year of your life trying to lose more fat because it's going to be frustrating and ineffective. 
Yeah, and I think it's like, you know, kind of seeing the bigger picture. Like this is not like Absolutely. a what was like what I usually kind of shared is the fact that most people like on average American actually goes on diets like at least four times a year. So every three months you're trying something different because you feel like you plateaued at something, which obviously leads to an important question is um, plateauing. Like what do you think it happens to many people and how do you kind of address those kind of situations when it comes down to fat loss and weight loss because people get frustrated and then that's the time where you're like, kind of have to have like deeper conversations into like explaining like, okay, this, the possibilities and why this may have maybe happening in your experience as a coach, what do you see is our typical common denominators when it comes down to plateaus and fat loss and weight loss? So I want to loop back to what you said about trying to diet four times a year, because if we uh, really just approached a solid fat loss phase, you'd only have to diet like that one time a year. Right. And so I'm like, you know, if you were actually successful that first time, we wouldn't, my lights are doing something crazy. Sorry. Um, If you were actually successful that first time, we wouldn't be here trying to diet every single season of the year. Right. So, um, and I think it's that perpetual dieting that really leads mostly to a plateau. Um, but I guess when I approach a client and they're, they're in this sticky phase, we're looking at a few things. One, like, is there something we're not catching? Like, is your reported intake actually a little higher than, or a little lower than it really is? So like, are there little missing pieces, um, that we need to account for? And, you know, I do think that fat loss, a fat loss phase is a really good time to dial in on tracking because it allows us to account for these variables. So sometimes at that, sometimes we've been in this deficit for too long. We're seeing a little more metabolic adaptation than normal, and it's time for a reverse to take a little break. Maybe that's like a full on reverse. Maybe it's a two week diet break, whatever that looks like. Um, The body needs a little bit of a, a little bit of a rest to hit pause on this fat loss. Then we can go back into this phase. Um, and I think that's usually, it's usually one of those two. Um, and, and there has to be just understanding from the client that like, they're going to get there. It's just not always this linear path. Yeah, I agree. You mentioned the word reverse. Um, we talked about it in the podcast before, um, but for audience and people listening in, so obviously we're both in sort of like the, the macro tracking type of world. Like how do you, what, what is like reverse? I'm, I'm guessing you're referring to reverse dieting. And, and when do you think it's like time for somebody to do something like that? Uh, because even like, it's a very, like, believe it or not, actually one of like the most like research terms in 2020 on Google, when it comes down to nutrition, it's actually how to get into a calorie deficit, which obviously tells me that people are kind of ste- stepping away a little bit more from like the whole concept of like, okay, keto, like, you know, I mean, in fasting, they started to understand that in order for you to be able to achieve fat loss, you have to be on a calorie deficit, or you have to obviously achieve like a state of like, energy balance that it's like you know you're consuming less and you're actually burning on a daily basis but with that obviously there's people that kind of come with different backgrounds and the dietary history of the individual i think obviously makes a big difference and let's say for example you have somebody that has been chronically dieting for a long time um the people that are scared to eat like every, anything and they're basically on a water diet almost you know what what is reverse diet and, and how do you define it and explain it to people on how to do it so if we take an individual who's been chronically dieting, they've been chronically under eating for who knows how long, but a long time, right? Like months or years, it doesn't matter. They've been under eating for so long. We have, well, in order to get into calorie deficit, we need to eat fewer calories than we're burning on average, right? So we take this baseline amount of calories we're burning um, and we eat fewer than that, right? So as we've been in this deficit for so long, this baseline adapts to being lower. So now we have to push calories even lower to stay in a deficit and even lower to stay in a deficit. And it's called metabolic adaptation. It's kind of like skewed in this myth of starvation mode. Like I'm eating so little that my body's holding on to fat. That doesn't happen, but you could be eating so little that in order to be in a deficit, you need to eat even less. And it's not ideal either. It's definitely not ideal, especially if you've like pushed to the point where in order to be in a deficit, you need to be eating a thousand calories a day. Um, So the idea of reverse dieting is reversing this metabolic adaptation by increasing your intake so that this baseline calories burned is higher. And once you've completed this, once you've spent time increasing your intake, then in order to get in a calorie deficit again, you don't have to eat a thousand calories a day. Maybe it's 
1800 calories a day because you've spent time allowing your body to be adequately fueled so that your next fat loss phase can be a lot more successful. Yeah. And it's a hard pill to swallow for many people that when, when you tell them like, Hey, I need to, we're going to try to, to start like increase your calories. Do you experience a lot of that pushback and like people being like, scared like shitless of like hey that you're telling me that I need to like and you're gonna bring me up to like 2,000 calories a day or like that you're going to kind of start like adding more carbs into my macros like do you experience that a lot and how do you uh kind of how do you respond to this yes for sure absolutely um and and I really just say to this client like listen my goal is your goal my goal is not to make you gain weight like that's not the that's not the goal here but Maybe we're well, going to see a few pounds gained, but also your energy is better. Your recovery is better. Your performance is better. And when it's finally time that you've earned this fat loss phase by fueling your body well, it's going to be really effective. Like how long have you been trying for this? And how long have you been miserable in trying for this? We don't have to do that anymore. Um, and, you know, I tend to reverse my clients pretty slowly, especially at first as they get the feel for eating more because it goes back to this, like these, you know, factors of behavioral health. It's not just like, okay, eat more done. Let me do it. You know, there, there are, um, there's huge opposition to this due to like fear of carbs, fear of food, you know, any background that gives this individual, um, hesitancy with eating more. So um, I do it slowly. I try to reassure them as, as much as possible. The goal is not weight gain. The goal is not for them to be miserable. The goal is for their optimal health first and always before that fat loss goal. This is the way to get both. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't know if it happens to you, but I think like a lot of times like, people start to have this like massive breakthroughs and then they're starting to like, wow, I actually am sleeping better or I am like having so much energy and I'm like, I'm pushing some more weight in the gym. It's like, duh, you're getting energy now, like, you know, that you're not getting before. And I feel like your body's obviously like loving that. I usually kind of explain this as like your body, which is like in, in neutral. And like, now you're kind of putting your metabolism into gear and it's actually moving faster and better because of the fact that you're kind of giving it exactly what it needs. Yeah. And chances are they haven't felt that way in so long. And I definitely have some clients that we go through this reverse. We're back in kind of maintenance mode and they're like, I think I'll just stay here. And I'm like, this is the greatest day ever. I yeah. am a very proud coach right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that obviously happens all the time. Um, did you believe that macro tracking may not be for some people? Or that do you sometimes like feel that even when you're explaining the concept of like consistency over perfection and all these different things, so you sometimes like feel like it's it's cautious and best to tell somebody like, okay, let's just not track um, at any given point? Definitely, I think this happens to be more the case with individuals with a background of disordered eating. Um, you know, if there's, if there starts to be this obsession with the numbers, this obsession with the app or the scale, I think it's always good to pull back um, because it's not helping anyone, you know? And then on the flip side, if someone's kind of scared, they're like, this seems like too much, like too hard. Like I don't have time for it. Uh, oftentimes I do try to still show that, that client that like, this is actually feasible. Look, let's, we don't need to make it hard. Let's not use a food scale. Let's use cups and tablespoons and stuff like that. Like, let's find a way that this is really feasible for you, that it's adding five extra minutes to your day, not two hours, you know, um, and let's show you how this can be really uh, possible for you, given your busy lifestyle or whatever you have going on. Um, and I wouldn't say it's just like pushing through. It's just really educating on how this can be uh, geared towards each individual in the way that they need. Yeah. I, I think obviously this, this type of approach is like the best way to kind of increase like adherence because at the end of the day, a diet that is going to work for like somebody is the one that people cannot definitely kind of stick to right. in the long term. which obviously like the last kind of part of the podcast, I wanted to kind of spend it like, you know, kind of give him some like quick and dirty tips that I feel like you like, you know, those little nuggets of like information that you get to your clients that can kind of help him like 
kind of change your perspectives like hey how about you actually make this or make that so and i know that you you talked a lot about it and because i you know i was kind of like you know stalking on your social media and seeing some of your content <laughs> and and i saw like one of the main areas that you you do talk about is like the flexibility to be able to like go on vacation and necessarily actually kind of feel um super like bad about the, the food choices that you're making or going out to eat a meal out or different things like that so what are some of like the the, the typical like you know strategies that you kind of give your clients or your audience when it comes down to the 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 things that sometimes they don't have a whole lot of control over like you know going on vacation going to different places and so forth um that you try to kind of like or the message you try to convey as far as that yeah i love this topic because i think this is kind of the breakthrough when it comes to flexible nutrition this idea of being flexible rather than just like the idea of tracking macros because um say we're at home we're in our normal routine, we're in our own kitchen, eating our own foods. Like, yes, it might be really feasible to track and easy to do so. So like, let's do it. Why not? There's no reason to estimate if like, you know what you're eating and it's right in front of you. It's not going to take any more time. Um, but how do we make it so that when you go out to eat or you're on vacation, it's not like, screw it. I'll just get back to this later. Like, I think it's really important to have um, minimum set Minimums meaning like the minimum thing we do to still take care of our health while we're gone and having habits to lean on. So usually I mentioned some of these before, but usually for my clients and saying, okay, how can we still get you to stay hydrated? Like, can you bring your water bottle with you all day and just sip on it and maybe drink a glass of water before each meal? Can you plan your meals around a protein and a veggie before these more calorie dense options? Can you maybe set some rules surrounding alcohol? Because this is something that can really throw people off when they're on vacation or eating out. It's the way for calories to end, to add up really quickly um, and to make you feel not so great, like once you're back to training or life or whatever. Um, maybe that's only zero calorie mixers. Maybe that's only two drinks. Maybe that's only one cocktail before you have like shots or something, you know, whatever that looks like for the person. Um, and how can we focus on like, maybe being in control of your snacking options while having a lot of flexibility when eating out. So I, I think it's really important to be able to peel back these layers and say, Hey, when I'm tracking macros, what am I really trying to do? I'm trying to get adequate protein. I'm trying to make sure there's balance between my fats and my carbs. I'm trying to fill my day with whole vol like high volume foods um, before going off to these more calorie dense foods. How can I do the same thing without worrying about my food scale and my tracking while I'm away? Yeah, that's awesome. Because I think a lot of times like people just people don't get, and then you made me realize like sometimes we need to take a step back to understand why are we tracking macros anyways. Yeah. Like and, and it's just again to like make sure that we're understanding we're getting enough protein and all these different things. And I love those steps because I think they're they're super helpful because I don't know, like most like anybody that kind of goes on vacation or the weekend, it just, they feel like they, they need to kind of like hand the diet gloves and then like, I'm going to like put them on the side and then I'm just going to forget about it. And vacation in some people's minds is like vacation from like, I can eat whatever I want. I right. can do whatever I want. I can sleep until whatever I want. And then really, they, it's just kind of like opposite poles. And, and there's like, you know, I'll just worry about my food choices when I get back. When in reality, like, I feel like people like, can't really understand that you can enjoy like your vacation and your food choices but not necessarily kind of going in extremes you know that i think it's just like a common misconception that many people have because again they're just so used to like a piece of paper telling them what to eat for breakfast lunch and dinner that all these foods are not in the hotel that you're at or like the buffet that you're kind of going to in that resort so like i think a lot of times it's like they they just believe that if it's not on the list and obviously they can't have it you know? Right. And I think this idea of like still sticking to those minimums or trying to do your best given a situation is not going to be perfect. And like, that's okay. Cause again, no one's asking it to be, um, maybe calories are higher. That's fine. But maybe that's also the difference between like maintaining your progress and coming back with a clean slate of like same weight, same body composition, maybe a little extra water weight. Cause you were traveling or like actually throwing your hard work from the past two, three, four weeks out the window and starting over at like square one. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Now being at home, like I think a lot of times like people also like they're not really 
like where they sell them that tell themselves that they're not good cooks. I remember when I was in college, I barely could make rice. Um, so things like a lot of times they come up with excuses or not necessarily excuses, but you know, obviously valid points that sometimes make it difficult for adherence. Um, and, and that's a part of it too, that I wanted to ask you kind of how, what are some like, again, quick and dirty tips that you try to give a lot of your clients when it comes down to like, whether it's food preparation, planning an organization, um, time management, and all these different things that kind of helps people not necessarily be thinking about food the entire day on how they're going to fit their macros and how they're going to get this because it happens sometimes in our programs. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people get so caught up in a rabbit hole of like things, then it shouldn't necessarily be like that way. So what are some of the things that you try to like preach and, and teach? So I think... I call this my number one macro tracking tip um, because I really think it's so helpful. It's how I handle my, my food too, but pre-tracking, if you can like sit down at the beginning of the day and spend five, 10 minutes kind of mapping out this loose idea of what your day is going to look like in my fitness pal and whatever you use to track, um, it just will save so much time throughout the day. Like you're just, you know, it's still, it's still available to flexibility. If you want to change something, if you end up going out to eat, if someone brings a treat into the office or whatever, you can still change, but this helps you kind of spread out your intake across the day. So you're not stuck at the end of the night playing like macro Tetris. Cause you have 30 grams of fat left and like one carb, you know, it kind of just helps you map out the day. Um, and if you want to talk about someone who's not a good cook, that is me. Like I do not enjoy it. <laughs> I do not uh, make recipes. I do not spend time in the kitchen because I have other things to do, you know? So I'm a really big fan of the idea of batch prepping. Like I'm never, ever going to meal prep my meals into containers and eat the same thing every day. Um, but I rely really heavily on the idea of like batch preparing um, a bunch of proteins for the week. So usually that means just grilling a ton of chicken and having like frozen chicken, canned tuna, whatever on hand that I know where it is and that it's available and ready to go. Um, like carb sources, like we cook rice at the beginning of the week, I usually make like bonza pasta and kind of make it into a pasta salad with veggies. Um, and then usually like squash or potatoes or something like that. And just they're on hand. I pre-chop my veggies a lot of times so that they're easy to go, like to, to just throw together and go. And then you have a meal and you're like, okay, easy. Let me make this pre-cooked chicken and this pre-cooked potatoes and like put some fat on it, but like some dressing or something in avocado and like, bam, protein, fat, and carbs. It's already done. We're good to go. Let's move on with life. <laughs> yeah. I know that I know that some people like want to cook and stuff and that's cool too. But if you're like, I don't have time. I don't like this. This is not fun. It can be so easy. And like, we're always sleeping on frozen foods, but they're fantastic. <laughs> I'm like a really I big agree. fan of like the Trader Joe's meals. And then even, um, you know, like frozen vegetables, it's the same nutritional value. Yep. Um, it's not bad. It's like, it's, I don't know that we can ever really call a vegetable bad. And that's just like really being nitpicky about, um, about things that don't matter. If you're like, Oh, I can't eat frozen. I can only eat fresh, you know, like, yeah. there are greater things to worry about here. For sure. And I think like you, like, I, I love those concepts, like batch prepping versus meal prepping. Cause I think like I, I'm, I'm, I teach the same thing. And, and we recently did a workshop on like, again, like meal prepping, but I'm thinking it was like, I need to change the name to like batch prepping. Uh, so essentially what we did is like, you know, a slow cooker, like a bunch of chicken. And then we, I literally in 30 minutes, I show how I can turn that into like four or five different meals, like a chicken pizza with like pita bread. And then there's uh, the, uh, the, the chicken with the bonsa pasta. And then like the mm -hmm. chicken with the rice that would like the minute rice if you wanted to kind of like make it so i think like a lot of times like people like overthink the process too much and because of that so they, they think of meal prepping that they have to put all the meals in like this like pre-portioned containers which don't get me wrong they can kind of help you like because again like it's just like grabbing it and heating it up but at the same time it doesn't kind of give a whole lot of people flexibility so that like, you get tired of eating the same thing you know monday through friday you know right. so like it just makes it easier that way and I feel like a lot of like my doctor or nurse clients, like they do that type of meal prep because it's what's necessary for them. And that's awesome. Like more power to them. But I work from home. I don't need to do that. You know, like I have a kitchen close by, but at the same time, don't want to spend a bunch of time in there. Um, so it's just finding a strategy that works for you, for your lifestyle, for your time. Um, there is no one way to meal prep or track your macros or follow a diet, whatever it is, there's just no right answer. Yeah, that's awesome. 
So just to kind of finish up, but before we kind of get into rapid fire questions, I always like to ask, like, what is like, as a coach, as somebody's like trying to, again, like pre- preventive measures to improve people's health, what is like the message that you try to convey to, to, to people? Like if you kind of had obviously the stage to talk to like 20,000 people, like, and they give you like 30 to seconds or so to actually kind of share a message as far as like, whether it's like food, like habits and all these different things, what would you tell those 20,000 people? Oh I never God. asked this question That's before. It's really actually. hard. <laughs> now I'm like, like envisioning myself on a stage and I would probably say a bunch of things. So <laughs> making it one, one thing is really well, hard. I like it. I'm thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's that it, it's, and I've already repeated this, but it, it's because I think it's so true and, and, and so important. It's this idea of consistency over perfection. I think really, the, the ability to be flexible and consistent is what leads to sustainable changes. Um, and, and focusing on this idea of perfection only makes us feel bad about ourselves when we miss the mark, when we don't come in with absolute perfection. Um, and it makes us feel like we've failed. So if we're able to focus on consistency and just doing our best, given, given any situation that life throws at us, because look, it's 2020. We know that the, anything can happen. Um, that's, what's going to set us up for long-term change. And that always has to be in view. Like we always need to be thinking about the long game. What am I doing right now? And how's that going to help me in the future? Yeah. And I think this applies to so many different areas of our life. And, you know, you as a Everything, owner, really, like, yeah. like if you focus too much, I think one of my mentor once told me like imperfect action will always beat standstill any day, you know? And I think like if, if you're just not afraid to just like take steps to just to be consistent and not necessarily that everything is just like perfect in your life. And a lot of times like with different personalities that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Virgo. So we're, I'm super analytical. And for me, things need to be like, like, you know, need to fall in the right places. So sometimes for some people, it's very difficult to kind of mm-hmm. like fathom that, but it's being okay and open, having an open mind to be able to say, you know what, like, I'm not going to be perfect with this because I know that this is like in the long term, what's going to be, be able to kind of give me the results that I want, the revenue that I want, whatever may be the case and whatever domain that we're talking about here. So um, that's awesome. Love that. I think, I think the 20,000 people are happy with the, with the message. Good. I would, I mean, I would probably prepare a little more, <laughs> people, but it would probably be the very similar message. <laughs> Good. That's awesome. Awesome. Great. All right. So we're going to finish off with some rapid fire questions. This is just basically some, you know, the first thing that kind of comes to your mind. Ready for that? Oh, man. Okay. I'm ready. It'll be, they'll be simple and super quick. So the first one would be, uh, what is your favorite movement or exercise that you like to do? Oh, quick. It's, cross, it's CrossFit and I like pull-ups. There you go. Wow, perfect. Okay. That's awesome. Sorry, That's I can't like, think. Okay. Yeah, no thinking. Uh, the second th- thing would be like, what is a book that you would recommend everybody to have on their shelf that you was just like, right now, if you need to buy it quickly, you need to go get it to give it to somebody, what would you choose? Atomic Habits by James Clear. Love that book. And we talk about it all the time. Great. Yeah, okay, adding that to the, Everyone uh, needs it. Seriously. <laughs> adding, adding that to the show notes. I love it. Um, third question would be, what is a podcast resource or something you would recommend people to kind of like go for, whether it's nutrition, or like personal uh, growth or whatever maybe the case that you would recommend people either to listen to or to watch uh, that you think is really helpful to you or to your audience? Nutrition. I like Sigma Nutrition Podcast. Yeah, it's, it's especially deep. for it's like deep. it's a lot. Especially for like the nerds, uh, yes, like us for the nerds. To like, <laughs> to like to learn a lot about nutrition. Awesome, that's a good one. Um, perfect. The last one and the most fun one is if you were stranded on a desert island for the rest of your life and you could choose one food and one food only to live off of, what would you be or what would you choose? I choose tacos. Like I know it's like a combo of different. It foods, could be a combo. But, it's okay, fine. tacos. That's one hundred percent. Good. Awesome. I don't have go. to think about that one. Good. Good. That's a good one. I think I've got it a couple of times in the past, but that's definitely, definitely a good one too. I choose pizza every day. So, but anyways. Oh, I would probably get <laughs> bored of pizza. I was going to say cookies, but I would like definitely get bored of, <laughs> of cookies. I will True. never get bored of tacos. Yeah. I guess like you can do many different ones. So that, that makes sense. That's awesome. Um, Kate, how can people, or like, what do you got going on right now? So I guess like, you know, I like to always kind of finish out this podcast to figure out, okay, what did you got going on? Uh, what it's like, you know, or how can people find you how can people connect with you and, and, and chat with you or work with you actually so i like to hang out over on instagram um at kl nutrition i try to put out as much you know free content as possible about nutrition and i really love questions so if you have questions about nutrition about anything 
I love to get questions and answer questions. Um, and then I offer one-on-one -on -one highly individualized nutrition coaching for anyone working towards aesthetic or performance or just overall health goals. And you can head to katelimannutrition.com and learn more about that. And while you're over there, you can go to my resources tab and I have a bunch of free resources to download. And actually one of them is a like batch prep cookbook and it's just the full versions on there for free. It will take you through like these, um, you know, you can, you can prepare all the food in about an hour and a half and how you can make it into meals for the whole week that are all different and has a lot of different um, like resources like a grocery list and, and a meal plan and all these things. Um, you might need there's a few other cookbooks and there's some at home workouts as well that's awesome i'm literally about to go in there and like download that because like now you told me about batch prepping and i'm not a big fan of cooking so I'm definitely it, i think it's out. really great and also like i said i'm not a good cook because i'm not but i have a team of coaches that works with me and one of them is a fantastic amazing incredible cook and she really does most of the kitchen work so like it's it's good it's good food like if it was just me it wouldn't be that good <laughs> that's awesome well guys you, you heard it from kate um definitely great resources and i think something that would be super helpful so all the links you're going to find in the show notes uh so you can obviously kind of like you know check those out download some of her free resources and even obviously this content and this message resonated with you even possibly even work with uh with kate and her coaching program as well um kate it was a pleasure to have you on uh thank you again so much for your time here today vivi nutrition radio Thank you. I'm happy to be here.